doing AMC calls and asks, you know, will you moderate a kick-ass panel? <laughs> what does one say, ma'am, in yellow? Yes. Hell yes. <laughs> you say, hell yes. And I'm a Texas, so it's hell yes. But welcome, everyone. I'm excited to introduce to you our panel, incredible women. To say kick-ass is to put it mildly. I got goosebumps from that trailer, and what you saw there is what they created. I need to wake up every morning to that trip. So can you please provide that? So let's get on with the show. Let me first introduce Melissa Bernstein, executive producer on Better Call Saul. Melissa. I feel like we need like rocking music when you walk out. Angela Kang, showrunner and executive producer on The Walking Dead. Marty Knox, and showrunner and executive producer on Diet Land. Let's see her. I have to sit down and see her. Okay. Welcome. We were doing a little chatting back there, and you know, we're bobbing our heads to that tease and all of the great female characters. Is it goosebump territory when you see really what's been created on AMC, especially in regards to strong female characters? Go ahead, Marty, go for it. I mean, I feel like the whole last few years, from the time that AMC said they would buy Diet Land and actually let us do it the way I had pitched it, and that they would support me as a director, you know, because um, I directed three of the first ten episodes. Um, that was goosebumps, and so it's kind of been like goosebumps on goosebumps. Um, and then to see the reception that the show has gotten, and the support in the press, and sort of in the general public, like I, watching, um, you know, people respond on Twitter the way they have, and and really saying, oh, I see myself for the first time on television, like that. That's what you do this for. That's what I do it for. Let me follow up on the uniqueness of a network saying. Here's a different type of character. She breaks all of the molds. By the way, I love the show. Um, and, and having that open checkbook, for lack of a better description, to well, bring to life. Well, I didn't say open. <laughs> 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 I really, I really, I really don't want to block you guys. <laughs> <laughs> but having the openness of creativity to bring your vision to life. Um, I mean, I feel like, and I keep comparing Dietland to Buffy in a way. Um, because um, I think it, it shares a lot of DNA with it. It's a it's a superhero show pretending not to be a superhero show. You know, Plum is really you know her cape is her wokeness. You know, for lack of a better word, she's um, she's coming. It's an origin story. The first season is an origin story about how someone becomes you know um, their best self. Um, and the thing that I learned on Buffy is you're never your best self for more than a few minutes. <laughs> then you go back to being, you know, your crappy self. So, um, and the thing about AMC is, is I could see with the characters that they had embraced with these more male shows that that was something they got. Um, they got that an anti-hero is actually a hero. You know, it's just straight up hero because we're all anti-heroes. We're all aspiring to be better than we think we are and failing every day. Um, and then we, every once in a while we have these moments where we actually hit the mark. Um, and this idea that a hero is someone who's heroic all the time is really boring. Which is why a lot of superhero more, movies, at least in the past, were super boring to me. Because I'm just like, I'm not interested in someone who doesn't mess up all the time. Deadpool is my favorite, you know. I'll have to vote for him now, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> sure, you know, Melissa, going to Marty's point of being our best selves when we can and having the failures. If you have advice that's bursting from the seams from your heart that you would offer to a young woman coming into the industry who wants to, if you will, follow in your footsteps, what is that key advice? I, um, I think it's really important to pursue the kind of stories that fill up your heart, like things that are truly fulfilling, things that truly move you, because it'll make the work so much easier. Um, and I also think it's really, this sounds boring probably, but it sounds, I think it's really important that, that the people that you decide to work with, like look at their history, look at how they, how they promote and who they promote and how they made their way up in the world. And like, and make sure that feels like a place that you can work. Interesting, so you have this vetting process 
in your head? Or is it something that you've carried along with you? Well, I mean, I just think it's like research that you do, you know, like with, for the people that you are going to be working for, working with, to make sure they, you know, their goals and values and their process is consistent with yours and, do you and think, offers you a path forward. Do you think that that vetting process is different for women than men? As, as, a historic figure in this industry, all of the things that you've accomplished, do you believe that you're vetting her? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I've made you kind of pot. But you have. You, you've got, when you look at the, the landscape of women who've accomplished what the three of you have, let's just be honest. It's not by the tens of thousands. Yeah, and I think in, to that point, I think it's important to look at who the people you are working with, how they've dealt with women, like how they, you know, have they been promoting women in, the, in their careers? Have they worked with women? Are they women? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, you know, I, I, you know, I know a lot of people, a lot of female uh, writers, directors, producers who make a concerted effort to work with other women, and they do that because it benefits them and because it's a, like a really productive safe process, and I, I think that's a, you know, a very worthy path too. Angela, bringing in your path and what you've accomplished, the first female showrunner on one of the most watched shows on the network and in television, um, do you think women bring a new perspective, especially when you're looking at a show like The Walking Dead? Well, what's really interesting is I've been on the show since the seventh episode on, and so <laughs> it's kind of like, I. I come with the house at this point. So I, think, I think a lot of times I just think of myself as the showrunner of The Walking Dead. That said, you know, I'm really, I'm so humbled by the opportunity to work on a show that's been such a juggernaut and that is so beloved by millions of fans around the world. And it's not lost on me that, you know, for a lot of women who watch the show and watch the strong women characters on the show and dress up as those characters, like, they, people are looking for role models, and um, you know I've been asked on a panel before. When did you know that you wanted to be a writer? Like, did, did you always know that you wanted to do this? And I was like, well, honestly, when I was a kid, I didn't think this was a job that I could have. There's nobody like me. Like, I didn't think there were women or Asian women running a show. Like, that wasn't a thing. And now, it's there's so many more women who are showrunners, and that's exciting because it means that the next generation can look and go hey, of course this is a job I can have. There's so many people who are able to do it, it kind of breaks some of the barriers to entry. And I think that, that makes it a really exciting moment in our industry. Do the characters help break some of the barriers to show women, young girls, that there's a place at the table when you see a Michonne, when you see Carol, and their backgrounds are so different, both what we see on the outside and what we know about them on the inside? Yeah, I, I really think so. I mean, we are cast, and even us as writers and producers, we hear from fans all the time, and a lot of our cast that uh, goes to these conventions and interact with the fans, they hear people say, like, your character made me feel like I could stand up to my abusive husband. Like, your character helped me become a stronger person. And it's, the power of fiction is, it's very powerful. Um, and our characters that are women, they go toe to toe with the men we don't write damsels in distress, or sometimes if they are, the men are males in distress. I don't know. <laughs> like the women save the men as much as the men save the women. It's really a story about survivors who help each other through the apocalypse. So it's really fun to write that type of story, knowing that there's no, like we never have to hold back to telling like a woman's story. It's just they are all different people that come with different types of baggage, with different types of pain, with different types of strength. And it's really fun to get to tell a long story where you see these people grow. People who started weak end up some of the strongest characters on our show, like Carol, who was this abused housewife, and now she's one of the most capable and strategic survivors we have. So that's been really satisfying. Marty, speaking of the satisfaction, and that is the positive, is there also a burden or a fear, especially now with social media, that you get the instant feedback on a character like Plum, and it, <laughs> Listen, we know everyone with a finger, and most of us have them, can get off social media. <laughs> doesn't mean you don't have a brain to match that finger. Don't quote me. But <laughs> well, when the little eggs come after a character anonymously yeah. or whatever, yeah. how does it ever impact how you deal with that? Well, I mean, I think it's, 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 it
approach the next episode or the next series. Well, it's it's really um, interesting because when I started on Buffy, low those many years ago. I mean, it's twenty one more years ago. Um, you know, we were one of the first shows that had an active online talkback community. There's like a, a message board called the Bronze, and I saw um, writers start to you know, people would sort of run to the bronze to see what the talkback was on your show. And some of the writers even started to have like their own little fan pages and their own, and I saw what that did to their egos and their sense of self-importance. And I remember I heard a writer, I think it was, um, I can't remember who it was, but Cameron Crow, say that one of the best things about being a writer is that people don't know that you're successful. And they, they may know your characters, but they don't know you. So you can go, you can move through the world still having a human experience. And and I never forgot that. So at some point during Buffy, I unplugged completely. And I stopped looking at any, and the truth is I do interact with my social media friends because it's part of my business. It's a business thing, and it's also part of my activism because I consider myself an activist too. So. I do that, and I usually say one half-joking thing to the me guys, and then I mute them, and then that's the end of that. Um, and then, um, but I don't read reviews. I've read one review of Diet Lamb that someone sent me and said, even you can't hate yourself over this one. And I read that one and agree that I couldn't hate myself and send it to my mom, but I've read nothing. And I've read nothing on, you know, the other show that's coming out this year. I, I just don't. And the only thing I ask of, of people who do is just tell me if there's a consensus. Um, if there's something I need to know that can help me make the show better. Um, so I unplug from that because I want to make sure that I'm still telling stories about what it's like to be human right now. Um, Melissa, let me ask you, before we end our panel, we will open for questions because mine are probably not as great as yours would be. Charlie's like, um, how great am I? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, often when women are kick-ass characters or controversial, they are deemed villains. And with Skylar, for example, um, the villain, the female character, whereas Walt was praised, how difficult is that? Or I hate using the word difficult. How interesting is that <laughs> uh, when you have that kind of response from the audience? And great. Yeah, I, I, we really weren't expecting that kind of feedback. I think, you know, the, and I'm a non-writing producer, but uh, when Vince and our writers were uh, developing that character and and drawing her and, you know, and 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 I think they were, uh, they were always feeling like she was completely justified in the uh, choices she was making, in the thoughts she was having, in the feelings she was having, and I think we're really surprised by the feeling from some fans that, you know, that she was harshing Walt's buzz, you know, like I think it was something that they were like, and, and I think part of it is due to, honestly, Brian Cranston's performance, like he just gave, and I don't mean to excuse like a you know, anti-feminist attitude, but I, I do think like Brian brought so much humanity to that character that people connected with him so much and so deeply mm -hmm. That they that they just anyone that was getting in his way, you know, yeah. I think was like a bit of an uh, antagonist. Um, but I do think there's you know there's so much uh, misogyny entrenched in our society and like in our the shows that we you know that that we've grown up on like there weren't as many strong women characters and I think that has an effect on the way that people take in media and take in television shows and take in characters and it's unfortunate but like this is who's you know fighting on the front lines to make that you know make a change for the future. Oh, I have to, I'm sorry just to interject that um, because I'm hoping I'll have a season two I just rewatched <laughs> season two of Breaking Bad with my 16 year old son and um, and we had such lively discussions about her um, and what's been great is the opportunity for me to say Okay, well, I'm a person who went through a divorce from your dad, if you remember. Um, I made a show about it, um, but, uh, which you've never watched. Whatever. Um, but I know you love Breaking Bad, you know. Anyway, uh, but what was so incredible is to have the opportunity to watch the show with him and say, but from her perspective, and just keep saying to him, but from her perspective, imagine this. 
but it is incredibly hard because Brian Cranston, I mean, Anna Gunn is one of the most amazing actors ever, and and I love some of the, and I kept saying, like, that's a really good choice she just made, like, she's trying to, like, li but it was so fascinating to have this conversation with a 16-year-old boy who's in the middle of this moment where there's so much anger toward women co coming back from this, you know, this whole headline women are people moment, um, you know, there's a lot of talk back in the internet and with young gamer boys that's really ugly. So it's, it's I mean, I would encourage anybody with a young man in their life to watch that season and just talk it through, because it's so powerful. I want to introduce Vincent Peter, um, I think you might like this person for this role because of the way I approach material and stuff like that. So it was a process where as soon as, you never as an actor want to fall prey to that feeling of, uh, I hope they like me because then that means I'm good. And that's a hard thing to keep your wheel out of the rut of. It keeps wanting to go back in there. Um, but in this instance, it was more that feeling that I'm sure all of us have had where, um, I thought, I'm going to present to you the portrait I came up with of this woman, with the jigsaw pieces I had at the time, which were not as many as I now have. Now have. But, um, and if you think it fits the story you're trying to tell, then, then this is going to be awesome. But it wasn't like shoehorning yourself into a role, if that makes sense, which I've done in the past. I wanted a role so badly, and I didn't understand why they didn't want me, and it was like, well, we're not telling the same story. And in this case, every step of the way, it felt like, I'd make a really strong choice, or a choice that I thought was maybe not as palatable or likable as I've been directed to be in the past, and they were like, oh, go more in that direction. And I thought, oh, okay, I definitely should be in this car. This should be in this car. It's going to be great. Yeah. Juliana, speaking of different rides and characters, this ride with Kitty, a villain, my favorite Kitty since Miss Kitty on Gunsmoke. <laughs> yes, I'm 48. <laughs> but, uh, and birthday in September, Jenna Hollenberger. Yeah. <laughs> I digress. Uh, this character, your first villain, and she is so good. What was it like for you to approach this role? Again, as in some ways, I think, just to be honest, it's, it's a that cool, cold, calculating businesswoman that sometimes can be a stereotype that you brought different dimension to. Yeah, I mean, first of all, it was such a pleasure to finally play uh, someone that people didn't have to like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you enjoyed that. You know, I, 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 you know, between Carol Hathaway and Alicia Florek, I was always the girl with the, her heart on her sleeve, and everyone could, you know, just wanted to give her a hug. Um, and so to play Kitty, where I don't think anyone really wants to come very close to her. <laughs> was just making sure, and Marty and I talked about this a lot, just making sure she wasn't a caricature of, you know, and I know, I, I understand that the, the roles of magazine editors, you know, you get the um, Devil Wears Prada and all that, and I, I wanted to stay clear, um, the luxury of television, and I have said this before, is that unlike movies, we get to grow with our character and show their journey, and so I got, I got to track her, so you meet her and she's very abrasive, but you're gonna find as you go through the journey with her what it took for her to get there. Um, that she has to walk into a boardroom full of white men over 60 who don't know anything about the fashion industry or women, and she has to kowtow to them. You understand her climb to get to where she is, and what I find interesting is that if she was a male, she would just be considered an amazing boss. But because she's a female, mm -hmm. she's she a is a villain. Mm -hmm. um, because she gets what she wants, and she's really good at her job, and she tells people to fuck off, and you know, and, and is very brash. She's brash. And um, that's what you need to do to be in that. I don't think you need to be mean, but that's how she's thought of. And I think that's from years and years of her building up this exterior wall that no one can touch her so she can succeed but that's only because that's all society would allow a woman to be. So you're either successful and a bitch, or you're loving and kind and everyone loves you, but you don't leave your house. And I think for Kitty, it's a great journey and it's so much fun to play. Um, you know, I get the best lines. In the whole show. <laughs> your lines are <laughs> we, we have a, well, I just want to interject that, and spoiler alert, if we get a season two, uh, 
we're going to, um, I want to do uh, a, a, like a, a pretty heart-wrenching reveal of stuff about your past, but then I want to have a, a just a really quick flashback when Kitty goes, you know, the truth is, though, I've always been this way. And you go to her at like two in a playground and she just pushes it. Because <laughs> I really just think some people are born that way. They are, they are born with um, the, their self-interest primary and their sense of survival primary. And that is how they live their life always. Mm. And it is just like, it's kind of boring to me that everybody needs like a sympathetic backstory. Like we all choose who we're going to be, right? We all have sympathetic right. backstories. It, it always yeah. is shocking because I'll come in and I'll say whatever's written. I always feel like <laughs> actors have to say what's on the page. My job is to make what's on the page. You did real. occasionally go like, um, <clears throat> this one. And every now and then I'd be like, um, and, and all the women, because the show is run by all these amazing, amazing women, they'd be like, oh, I had a boss like that. Oh, yeah, I know. I don't know people. And can, <laughs> they're not in my orbit. So it's all quite yeah. shocking to me, but so delicious. I it's had just, a boss like Kitty, but it, it was a male. And, and well, if, we yeah, portrayed, yeah. if we portrayed what that male was like, people would not, they'd not right. believe it. So right. I just was like, let's just go 30% of that boss, and that'll be it. <laughs> <laughs> Going to some of your characters, whether they were described as villains, bitches, strong, or whatever, they have this texture that Marty points out makes the character so interesting. V, who I still don't know how to define V from Orange is the New Black, but she was intense. I didn't want to meet her in the playground. <laughs> Did Cressida, in, are these characters individuals that you are drawn to, or is it the show that draws you in? Um, Clearly, it's the characters because I, when I was again, the offer is, is a lovely thing <laughs> <laughs> to get to the point where you can you can get an offer. Um, when I was offered Orange, I had never seen it, mm. and when I was offered um, Into the Badlands, I'd never seen that. <laughs> and so I, you know, I have, I have good life. I don't watch a lot of. I mean to, but I don't. <laughs> so I'm always drawn to complexity or um, a, a sketch of a character that um, I, I believe um, I can inject interesting complexity. And I love playing with the light and the dark, the shadow self and the, 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 the angel self because I think they are always um, at war and, and fighting within each of us. And I like surprises. I like surprising myself. And um, I find the older that I get, the, I was brave in my 20s. I, I didn't know I couldn't fail. Mm -hmm. And then I got terrifically safe. And then in my 50s, I'm, I'm so brave again. Because I don't care. It's hard to fucking diet. It's, 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 it's hard to, you know, it takes so long to look all natural. <laughs> it's really easy to look like a drag queen at this point. It really takes a long time. Um, so to find roles where, to find roles where, I can really play, just not care how it looks, but be so invested in how it feels, and, and the game that I'm playing with myself, and the, 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 the challenges I, 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 I give myself in this role. How simple can I be? How naked can I be? How much truth can I actually tell? How present can I be? How little can I do? Um, how clearly? How clearly can I think? How brave can I be physically? Um, these are. That's me and myself. That's good stuff. standing over there as my manager. The other thing is now, you know, all the women on this panel, we, we have enough experience where we're often. We're lucky. I mean, lucky to be offered roles. And now, 
we're not sitting like the, the girls on the side waiting to be chosen by the boys. Um, I now also interview the producers who are offering it to me. Mm -hmm. Because do I actually want to work with these human beings? Yes, the role is interesting, but I'm also old enough now where I want kindness. Yeah. I want an environment where I'm safe and where I'm free and where I'm trusted and where I'm charged with this and gifted with this, but you must almost you must also trust me because my agenda may not necessarily be yours. And I bet you anything. I will take it further than you have envisioned. Because I push myself far more than you would, you would push me. So this is what I ask. And I ask producers really tough questions. You know, are you kind? <laughs> are you a kind human? Tell me what makes you kind. What makes you kind on the set? How are your children? Do they like you? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, <laughs> <laughs> honey, I love you. Um, so, um, that's a long winded answer to say um, I choose my roles very, very personally now. Well, on that note, I'll open them. <laughs> 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 <laughs>